Good evening and welcome to James Purley and Sons. Uh, this is the eight stages of gun making. Tonight will be uh, the third and fourth stages. My name is James Bryan, I'm the Office Sales Service Manager here at Purley. Um, we have uh, tonight, we will be looking through all the components for the locks, I'll use them side to side, and single triggers and double triggers. So let's go and meet our lock maker. So tonight, we, we are Tom Nichols here, the Transformation Manager and Senior Craftsman, will be showing us all the locks and triggers. Tom, back to you. Thank you. Uh, hello everybody, uh, welcome back to the Furley Factory once again. Uh, tonight you'll see me in a white coat, which this far has not been what I've been doing. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our locks and triggers, um, how we make the locks, uh, where we start from. Um, and also the triggers are both single and double. Uh, we're also going to look at the side by side lock and the over and under lock um, and really go from there. Uh, I was very lucky after coming out of my time as a finishing apprentice to be trained in lock making. Um, never actually made a trigger but I really understand them so we can talk through that and we can look at the different ways in which they work before we come back to finishing and we see how actually they're regulated and turn into the final actual finished product. So, as I say, we're gonna talk about where we started from, where we're at now, the two different types of lock, the two different types of trigger. Um, firstly, we'll talk about the cyber side. Cyber side uh, designed, uh, is the self-opening system designed by Frederick Beasley back in 1880, I believe it was. I may have got that wrong, but I hope I didn't. Um, self-opening system, Techniques very similar to building the over and under, which was from the Woodward uh, backlock design, um, which we acquired in the 50s. No. Um, so, as I say, not my number one discipline, but unfortunately due to COVID, we are looking at it from this perspective tonight. So, lock making. Pre-machine shop, so we use CNC now at uh, Purdy uh, to raw manufacture our parts before they come up onto the craft floor, which you've all seen before, um, in a raw state for us then to provide craft and all the elements that go into it and to keep the tradition and the craft element of the business alive. Um, if we come across here, you can see that pre-machine shop days, these two elements here, so this will be a trigger plate and this is a lock plate. Um, they were castings and they were put onto various jigs and hand machined into um, lock plates. Um, now we get the raw product up from downstairs and what you see next to these here is the current product coming up to the craft floor which still requires, even though they look a lot more refined, still requires an awful lot of work to be turned into a lock which can then be turned into a gun. Um, We've kind of jumped ahead a little bit in this situation, as I explained last time, um, in the fact that the action filer still needs the locks to be able to do his full job. So it gets a little bit disjointed at this part because the locks are made in conjunction with the action. They all meet in the middle, um, so they can all be connected up. The trigger plate doesn't come into play until stocking stage, so we'll cover that off when we do the next stage, uh, sorry, after ejecting, when we do stocking later on in, in the series. Um, so what have we got? We have the cyber side, we have the over and under. The techniques involved in making these locks are very, very similar. So we get the raw lock plate from the stores. Now, as you can see here, we have a guide lock plate, which is hardened, and we have the soft lock plate on the other side, which is raw from the stores and ready to be turned into a gun. Now they don't match. So the first thing we have to look at doing is matching up the profile of these two so we can crack on and actually start building the gun, uh, sort of building the lock um, to move forward. It's very simple. We actually file the profile of the outside of the lock to match the gauge, and we will use files. So, looking at what we've got here, you can see we've got the soft lock plate over this side. We've got two guide pins coming through, through the tumbler slot and through the back, which is where the main screen goes. And we will very simply file it to match the profile of the gun, uh, match the file, profile of the uh, template. We 
be very careful to be matching everything and make sure everything's in line. As you can see here, as we come round, you've got the template on this side, you've still got the excess material up here, coming round this side, into the back where it enters the action. Now, we don't file too much around this area at this point, because the action filer will do that job when they fit the gun, uh, fit the lock plate into the action. This profile is very important for the stocker. So when the stocker actually comes to actually uh, let it into the wood, it needs to have an angle placed upon it. I'll come back onto that later on, because we come to that later. So once we've got the exact profile we need and we've filed all around and we're polished and we're happy where we are, we then have to look at the threads and fitting the actual parts of the gun. So they come up from the machine shop looking very much like this. So as you can see, lots of machine marks, lots of other things still going on and an awful lot of work that still needs to be gone into it. First job, all of the tapping and dyeing. So over here, I've got all the tools we would use to tap and dye the, trop, uh, the lock plate. Um, various different thread sizes across the board. Um, these three holes you see, sorry, not those three holes. These three holes you see here are your bridle pin holes. This is a side-by-side -side lock plate, uh, which is not particularly helpful for this description because I need an over and under lock plate. So you'll see the over and under um, lock plate differs slightly in the fact that it has turrets rather than just blank holes. On the side-by-side on -side bridle, which is this part here, which is actually one of the most fundamental parts of the gun because it holds the whole entire lock plate together, is a flat plate. Now when these come to us, these holes here are undersized and not threaded. So our first job is to actually drill through the pilot holes that are here and then tap them. For that job, we have very specific tap sizes. Um, in the case of the over and under, here's a 6BA tap, which you can see here. So our first job will be to draw the pilot hole through all the turrets. Our second job will be to come back to the bench and use this tap wrench here with the tap in it, which will go through the three different sizes. Now it's quite important because there is a starter tap, a middle tap and a finish tap. Now the starter tap is very tapered with not much thread at the beginning. So what it gives you is an initial lead. So you get nice and parallel through the lock plate, <coughs> excuse me, and out the other side. You'll then move up to the middle tap and then finally the final tap, which gives you the nice clean thread that goes all the way through. Now it's all done by hand and is obviously very essential to the fitment of the bridle. Secondary. So the next part we fit is the tumbler. Probably the most important part in the entire gun because this is the thing that makes it go bang. So if you can imagine this rotating forward under the power of the mainspring, it hits the striker, and then we get the gun going off. That was the component that essentially replaced the hammer. <laughs> the the hammer guns. And a lock. So as you can see here, this hole also is undersized, so we'll use a reamer just to ream that out by hand again fit the tumbler so there is no rattle, left or right, up or down. No, you don't want any free play, but you also do not want a bearing on the back side of the lock plate. So what you'll find on the opposite side of that here is a boss. So that boss is actually keeping it away from the lock plate. This is bearing, the rest of the moving surface is not, because you do not want an interference here. Bearing on here, that's gonna interfere with the uh, operation of the gun. More of that comes later into the finishing process. What we're looking at at the moment is to get really, really tight tolerances so we're not gonna get any degradation through the rest of the build process. From there, we're then fitting the bridle. Same process here. If needs be, if it's tight, reamer through the bridle. This one's still very tight, so I won't force it on. But what you're looking for then is to bed that down and that is, this section here is actually holding the entire lock together. With the three bridle pins here, that locks the whole thing down. You then get a free moving part on the inside that is not bearing on the lock plate um, and can move, essentially. As you can see at this point as well, there's also a lot of machine marks in the tumbler, which we are looking to remove because they are very, very tight tolerance. We're getting them up so they would not move without any handwork applied to them. So we need to ease that with files again to make sure that we can get a movement underneath the tumbler. From there, we start then looking at the main seal. Now, I'm 
I'm going to go to a completed lock over here, because the main seal seems to have gone walkabout. So underneath here, you can see the main seal. And again, we're talking about an over and under. We'll look at the side-by-side -side lock in a minute. So the main seal is a section that is lifted by the trigger. So when we come onto the triggers in a minute, I'll explain that a little bit more. But the main sphere is, is lifted by the trigger, which then allows the mainspring to, um, well, basically, it can press it. When the gun is cocked, it's, I'll tell you what, it's going to be a lot easier to show you on this bit. So, completed lock here on the jig. So, this is the lock in its cock position. Underneath here, as I was just explaining, you have the main sear. On the top here, you have the intercepting sear. When the trigger, so if you imagine this is a trigger lifting, it lifts both of those sears out of the way, disengaging the main sear from the tumbler because the mainspring is actually under tension here. When you lift it like so, the gun fires. Again, when you open the gun, there's a cam at the back of the action, which we'll talk about when we come to ejection, that recocks the gun, and then you can go again. So with that, Tom, the intercepts here, there is the intercepts here. There is a safety mechanism also. One hundred percent. So we can we can also, if you'd like to, show, <coughs> if you'd like to show. So as that comes back, if I just use my finger, if I, if this intercepts here here, doesn't engage. That's where it stops. So the intercepts here there isn't is it, if it isn't lifted at the same time and it's not regulated properly, it will not fire. And reach there and reach the reach the striking point. That's what that's there for. Yeah. So we'll work on, as Jim was just explaining, so we'll fit the main sear first to the tumbler. We'll adjust also the nose of the bent on the main sear. So what I mean by, um, we've got the bent and the nose, which actually regulate the trigger pull. So here, you'll see a step. And on the nose of the main sear, here, you'll see another angle. And we call that the nose of the sear and the bent of the tumbler. That angle at start point here has quite a set angle that is put in by the uh, lock uh, maker and is adjusted by the finisher later on to regulate the final pull when all the heat treatment of the stills is, is complete. As Jim was just explaining, we fit the main sear, then we come onto the intercepting sear. So Jim's just very well demonstrated the role of the intercepting sear, which is a safety mechanism. So if something goes wrong with the gun, it's dropped, it's bashed or something else, we obviously don't want it going off. So the intercepting sear plays that role. That fits over the front turret, over the bridle, like so. And again, we leave it nice and tight at the moment for free and easy movement, but again, reamed, fitted, done. The springs, again, come up to us very, very heavy and not heat treated. So you can see here, they're actually quite thick. They don't look it, probably on the video, but they are actually really, really thick compared to our eyes. Now, too much weight in those really has an interference with your trigger pull later on in the process. So during the lock making process, you will lighten them to a certain point before you then heat treat them. Heat treatment is done up here and we will all harden those quench and temper, so they still have the spring that we need. And we're looking for around about two and a half to three pounds worth of weight in those springs. They are return springs, so they actually return the parts back to where they need to be after firing. So as you can imagine the gun opening like so, and everything moving under a cam and um, uh, rod system, they actually cock themselves back into the position. They are return springs, return everything back to its cock position. The main spring, in an over and under, effectively is purely for firing. The mainspring in a side by side, as I was explaining earlier, has a completely different role. So the techniques for fitting everything are exactly the same, but, so we're going over to the side by side with the self opening system. So if you imagine the gun in its cock position, so this is the gun closed, so the mainspring here is under tension. When the mainspring is lifted, again, we have the same thing here with the intercepting sear, performing the same function as would be performed by the uh, over and under intercepting sear, and the main sear here coming into the bent and the nose here. When the gun is fired, 
like so. And the opening of the gun is all under tension in this mainspring here. So as you open the gun, if you imagine this moving back like so, intercepting sear clicks in first, main sear second, and that spring there is having the action of actually pushing the barrels down, making for a quicker um, loading situation. So if I just do that again, to so imagine the gun opening now, so you can see the spring working, intercepting sear clicking in, main spring behind it. And obviously the weight of that is double because obviously there's two barrels. So that is actually pulling, pulling down both the barrels. <coughs> so we've talked a lot about, probably slightly disjointedly really across the two locks, about how we put them together. So there's tapping, there's dyeing, there's uh, reaming, uh, polishing, filing and fitting. Um, and then we have to really think about the actual fitment of how the gun's gonna go together. So as I said before, we uh, don't really touch the area around here because that would be the action filer's job. We do look at the angle that the stockers need to be able to let the lock plate into the gun. It's easy to see this on the video. So you can see there, the profile across the top, where I filed it a little bit earlier on, is very flat. This area all around here, up to about here, all goes into the wood. And it needs a draw to be allowed to do that. So the side pin, when it's actually put through, will need a draw so it can actually pull itself into the wood and give you a really fine line on the outside and a very tight fit on the inside. And the stocker will stock it to that. To do that, we use this gauge here. Again, very, very hand, but you can see that there, so this gauge, that's the set angle that needs to come all the way around this lock plate from the outside leading in. So you have more material up on the outside of the lock plate and less on the inside. To do that, take the lock plate and the gauge and we have a little look. Okay, you can see the gap there underneath the lock plate, leading all the way out to there. And that's got to travel all the way around here to the other end. What it actually is, is a filing exercise. So you'll start on the inside edge where you know you need the material to remove itself. So you'll start here. see there that inside edge is now down to within a slight tolerance but down to allow a polishing tolerance of where that angle needs to be now we'll keep doing that all the way around this lock plate but we'll also leave ourselves enough room to make sure we don't leave any file marks on the outside of that so it's perfect we'll take it down to roughly around about a 180 grip probably 320 so it gives the stocker some room to play with and then let it into the wood the end of all this for lock making essentially is fitting the mainspring and making sure everything actually moves. Now I've demonstrated it over there with the, uh, the side by side. The over and under is a little bit harder to demonstrate because you actually have to hand cock it. Now I can do that here. The fitting of the mainspring on over and under because it's a uh, back lock or a rebounding back lock um, is quite critical. What's a, uh, what's a rebounding back lock? Which so the rebound uh, is there essentially on over and under because the strikers come through at angles rather than at a straight, like a side by side. So you have the, on the side by side, obviously you've got the strikers coming straight through the face of the action, which can be hit by a hammer or a tumbler to make the gun go bang. In an over and under, they come through at angles on both sides of the gun, one steeper than the other. So the idea of a rebounding lock is that the lock will fire, come forward, and then come slightly back on itself. If it didn't come back on itself and it locked jam solid, like a side by side, you would not be able to physically open the gun because the striker would still be forced through into the primer after the gun's gone off 
and you'll break the nose off your striker. So the rebound is very, very critical, not only for making sure the gun goes off, but also for making sure you can open it. So it's a very, very fine line as to where you set the rebound at. Because the second the rebound starts to kick in, so as the tumbler comes forward like that, when it reaches its full travel, the rebound from the bottom leg, which is regulated by this block here, is actually starting to act on the tumbler and pull it back. So it's a very fine line between too much rebound and not enough rebound. Now, we leave them with minimum rebound at this stage because there's still a long way to go in the process. And when it comes to the finishing shot and we start looking at the strike and at the angle of the strike and everything else that goes with it, we then can actually tickle the rebound based on this block here. Even more critical with smaller calibers because you're asking smaller parts to start doing the same job as a bigger part. Yeah. The primer cartridge in the 410 is exactly the same as it is in a 12 ball. So when you start reducing the size of parts that you put into the gun, you're still asking the same spring, or a smaller spring to provide the same weight and do the same job. So rebounding over and under is critical. Um, the cyber side doesn't. Similar sort of thing, comes forward to its complete stop position. As soon as you start opening the gun, the lock starts to move so you don't get any of that drag from the strikers. Sometimes if the cocking needs regulating again, which we'll talk about when we come into the finishing shop, you do have to play with the cocking to make sure the cocking's picking up at the right time to do that. Um, has any questions come through yet? No? At the moment, because I think a lot of people think that the side sides and OUs are designed the same way. Mm. Um, they're actually not, they're, they're a complete different entity, essentially, aren't they? They look the same, um, but they're designed differently and the mechanics of them need to be regulated differently. Yeah. So um, what Tom's explaining here is it just it's not a default sort of mechanical setting that we do when it comes to uh, different components and different, <coughs> um, different locks, especially, and we'll get onto triggers also. Um, it's very individual to, to what specs that we have to deal with. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's, it's the, the production of the lock is more about keeping the tolerance there and keeping the weight and keeping everything we need for it to continue on through the process to give the action at the right level of uh, meat still here to be able to file the tumbler so they can get the correct strike. To put the angles on here, which is again all done by the action filer, to make sure that when that over and under lock, and again the same for the side by side lock, as it comes forward, it's got the right amount of coverage the right amount of travel and everything else that goes with it to make sure it's doing its correct job. So we have a question, mm -hmm. um, do all the parts get hardened or is it just the main springs? No, so the main springs have their own form of uh, heat treatment. Uh, they are springs, so they need the longevity of life, so they have their own heat treatment. The internal parts are not hardened at this stage apart from the return springs as I was speaking about earlier on. The tumblers, main sears, Intercepting sears are all hardened during the finishing process, which we'll cover off when we come to the finishing. Um, but yeah, they do have their individual parts, but not at this stage. Um, they've still got a long way to go and a lot of work to go through them and a lot of working. And we don't set the final tolerances until they hit the finishing shop when we're actually making them into a, um, a final mechanical belt. Um, so, at the end of the whole process, as I showed you earlier with the side by side, we have this. So what you do actually have is the tumbler fitted first, as I said, then the sears, then the return springs, then the main spring, and everything bolts together nicely. The final thing you actually fit here is the, this is a side by side lock again, is the lock lifter, which forms a vital part of the cocking which we'll again speak about when we come to ejecting next time round. <laughs> 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 so moving on to the triggers. Um, just, to, just as a final point, these, these locks here um, are all then polished down to a, a grit of about 600, maybe 800, depending on what we're going to use them for. Um, and then go to the action filer for this area here to all be adjusted for the strike and this area here to be adjusted for strong. Can I also just, uh, just, just to say that a lot of our tools that we use are all handmade. Yes, we do have generic sort of tooling, such as dies and stuff, but um, spring clamps and uh, yeah. you know, all these sort of things are all handmade for, for, these, for this sort of purpose. So. As Jim rightly said, this is a spring clamp, so this is a main spring clamp for a side-by-side. -side. So quite simple, really. 
You make these as an apprentice, and you should use them for years. So the mainspring clamp slides on like so. You can then clamp it up. Compress the mainspring. If I had the right tool. It's fitted well, isn't it? Yeah, it's fitted far too well. <laughs> I need to get out this thing. A bit of copper would be useful. And you can actually lever the mainspring out the back and remove it like so. You then have it under tension. You've got to be careful at this stage actually not to over compress them. If you over compress them past they would normally act in the gun, um, they can fracture through the back. So you just need to be careful not to over compress them. And very carefully, you just unwind it. And it slides and then you have the mainspring removed. So that's for the mainspring uh, on the side by side. Smaller clamps you see here you'd use for the over and under mainspring there because there's less room to get the big mainsprings in and that also works for lever springs and anything else that you want to compress as a smaller type of spring so yeah we make all those um, and it's part of the learning process through your apprenticeship you learn how to polish you learn how to machine you learn how to fire you learn how to drill you learn how to tap and that leads very nicely into this sort of area when we start to get into the mechanics of the gun so you can actually yeah uh, uh, yeah do things without the risk of uh, damaging part of the gun. So, moving swiftly on. Triggers. Purdies across both of our best guns use exactly the same system effectively. We have the double trigger and we have the single trigger. Single trigger is by far the more complex, which we'll cover second, but first off we'll look at the double trigger, which in reality is two very simple blades, uh, which come up as quite a large blank uh, like so. So they come up from downstairs as a very large blank here. You can see there's no profile at all filed on any of this. There are no holes in it. There is nothing really to say that that is a trigger. It looks like a bit of a square lump of metal. So the trigger maker, first off, will take the trigger plate, which comes up quite nicely profiled actually, but will then look at fitting this trigger and making sure the holes, you can see the pin coming through here, is at the correct pivot point within the trigger here. Um, also this hole here is the spring, so the return spring for the double trigger. And they will fit those really to the gun first to make sure all the holes are in the correct place and everything is kind of free and moving. Double trigger, as I said, very, very simple. It is two individual blades. If you imagine two locks coming in either side of the gun, again, hung, as we call it, by the finishing shop, they sit inside those triggers. So you get one lock coming in from that side, and again, the other lock coming in from the other side. That work is done later on in the process again, um, but then there are very set tolerances and very set plays, etc., etc. The real skill in trigger filing comes into the fact that when you start looking at the profile. Now, everybody's fingers differ. All right? We can file up the triggers to whatever real profile you want, and the reason they're so big is because that accommodates left-handed shooters and right-handed shooters. So we can turn the trigger left or right. We can also do it with the guard. So when they come to fit the guard, so you've got a raw guard here and a finished guard here, you'll see two beads. Now, traditionally, uh, you would have a beaded guard just to protect your finger from the sharp edge that you might have here when you put your finger through here. So it's just a nice rounded edge there to make sure you're not cutting yourself on, on the side of it. Um, and we have a universal part, effectively. What you can see is very, very unrefined compared to what we've got going on in the finished product. So the bead is hand filed and hand shaped, taken off whatever side it needs to be taken off of, and it's pre-threaded, but has to come to an absolute stop. Because at the moment, the breech pin, again, which we'll come onto in stock in, is not drilled through the top of the trigger plate. Now the breech pin holds the trigger plate up into the bottom, and there is another pin that comes to the bottom here that holds the top strap together. Effectively, the two main pins holding the gun together in its entirety. Um, so quite a lot of work there. So the actual filing of the triggers is very, very much an acquired skill. One that I will 100% say I don't have. So I won't even attempt to show it. Um, the guys that do it, very trained. You can see there's a very elegant sweep down. Very, very nice. This is a right-handed gun, so a cast off. You can see the way your trigger, your finger would naturally slip into that gap and give you enough meat on the other side. 
So as I say, very simple system, two blades, two triggers, one guard, trigger plate, and a return spring, All right, which is effectively taking up any gaps that are in the mechanism to make it feel nice and tight and ready to go. Really, really nice. Another thing that also happened with this is the, again, the tapping, the dyeing, the reaming of the pin, um, again, and down the back as well. Also the heat treatment of this spring. Uh, the triggers are heat treated a lot later on, again in the finishing process, so they are hardened later on to give them longevity and, and wear resistance, again later on in the process. Then we come on to the single trigger, which is quite a different beast in a way. Uh, single trigger, as you can see, only has one trigger, which is a central blade here, you can see in the middle, with a bob weight attached to the back. Now the bob weight is the mechanical um, element to the trigger. It has two blades either side. Now again, very similar to the way in which the side by side, uh, to the double trigger works. You have the uh, locks hung with the main sears in the blades. I'll swap across the one demonstrator over here. So what is effectively a regulated gun. So the Purdy single trigger mechanism is actually mechanical, which is aided by recoil. It doesn't require recoil to work which is actually quite rare. Well, not rare, but very nice to actually be able to regulate and work on. So, if you imagine these here are the locks coming in from the side and the trigger plate is in here. When the trigger is first lifted, you will see the right hand blade lift and the bob weight clicked under the back hand side of the right hand blade. When the gun has gone off and you release the trigger forward, you will see the bob weight slide down the back, click under the left hand blade, and then lift that, and the left hand will go bang. So very mechanical. This weight is very critical here, um, in the fact that this actually needs to be a certain weight, hence why it's called a bob weight, rather than just a movie thing. Um, also, the, <laughs> sorry. also, the coil spring and the plunger that are in there, the, the designated weight of that are, are very, very critical. So when the trigger maker is actually making the trigger, he's leaving these tolerances really, really tight again for the finisher. So this one won't actually work. So it will lift the right hand blade, but it won't come down and it won't move forward and click under the left hand blade. That is all left for the finisher when they come to actually set everything up on the wood and make the gun its final finished working product. Um, and that, I guess, is really that, unless Jim, you've got anything else to add to it? To no, I mean, um, a lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, discussion over whether our, our, our single triggers are inertia driven <laughs> or mechanical. Um, and we'll leave that up to everyone else to yeah, discuss. Everybody else can discuss um, But please message us and keep on uh, call, uh, basically giving us questions. We'll try and answer them. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the third and fourth instalment of uh, the gun series. Thanks for joining us. Take care.